Okay, welcome back to part two here. Uh, what we're going to do in, in this second section is we're going to parallel childhood attachment uh, with emotional conditioning. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is the brain. And we're going to kind of bring that in and explain how it wires up and what goes on. Uh, <clears throat> but first I need to explain in simple terms what, what emotions are and how they correspond to physiological constructs. It's, it's been proffered that, that we have six universal emotions, okay? Um, there's anger, there's fear, there's, there's sadness, there's elation, uh, which is ha happiness, elation, surprise, and, and disgust. Those are the six, if um, yeah, those are the six. And uh, these all refer to specific uh, places in the brain, mainly our, our limbic system, which in, in this here I'll show you, is, is located uh, down in here. It's inside. This is a cutaway, what we call a medial view. Here, you can see it in here somewhat. I don't know, but it's, it's right in here. The limbic system, that, that houses uh, our emotions, okay? Uh, that anger, fear, sadness, elation, uh, disgust, and surprise. <coughs> And it's also when the insula, and the insula too, I can't remember, forget about that. The insula, which is uh, up here, is, that's mainly the, the part of disgust in here. And then we have what is known as the cingulate cortex that runs through here. It's just below the, the, what we call the corpus callosum, and that's the intermediary between both halves of our brain, both hemispheres. It, it wires, it's, it's all part of that uh, linking one side of the brain to, to the other in, in that respect. So, and we have what's called white, we have what's white matter and gray matter, and the white matter are the axons or the wires, and the gray matter are, are the neurons. Uh, so these areas of our limbic system, insula and cingulate cortex, uh, along with certain neurochemical interactions, uh, will cause our sympathetic or parasympathetic system to, to activate, uh, causing uh, cortisol, uh, ATCH, endorphins, or, or adrenaline to cascade. Uh, those are just a few. <clears throat> these, these areas wire up, excuse me, the, these areas wire up uh, in a sense to, uh, let me, my doggy here, give me a second. So, that was a dog there. He, bumped the chair and about knocked my water over. But <clears throat> so these areas, they, they wire up uh, during early development, mainly the first three years of our life. And also you'll see a, a sort of an expansion during adolescence also. They, they either become what we call sensitive or these areas are become desensitized, meaning they, they're, they're easily activated or they're inhibited with slight provocations. <clears throat> Now, emotions are what happen inside our bodies, okay? That physical reaction of revving up or this downward spiral of sadness or what we call dysphoria. Uh, now, feelings, they are the descriptive words to, to describe those emotions. For example, uh, I can become emotionally, I can emotionally experience fear and then describe the feeling as being threatened or feeling vulnerable. <clears throat> So how emotions develop, it's, it's twofold in that sense. First, they are genetically transmitted, or what we call uh, temperament at birth, okay? When the child's born, they have a temperament. Now, there are nine recognized basic temperaments, uh, but we won't get into those today because they're pretty extensive. And, but on the other hand, secondly, emotions are conditioned, or what we call learned behaviors, basically in the first three years of life by our caregivers actions or inactions uh, hence attachment <clears throat> okay so there's this interplay between infant temperament and attachment that bonding to to the parent to the caregiver if a child is very difficult uh, because they have an overly sensitive or active limbic system what we talked about earlier in that brain area the mother may not have those emotional tools necessary to appropriately respond. Or let's say a child is stoically real easy, just easy to care for. Uh, the 
caregiver may not attune to the needs or of that child, or they may disrupt the child, causing an intrusive sense. Okay, with it. Now I need to emphasize th this point here. <clears throat> Constantly attending to the child is probably more problematic for, for emotional development than periodically attuning uh, and attending, okay? Sometimes children just need to be left alone to explore and discover the world. So, so that's what I talked about helicopter parenting earlier. Now, to get into what we call conditioned emotions, uh, when a child is in gestation around the seventh month, the amygdala, what we call the amygdala, is fully formed and mature enough to process both internal and external stimuli and begin this learning process. Now, the amygdala is part of the limbic system, and it's uh, probably better on, on this one here to, to see where it's at on this medial view here. It's down here, kind of blow on, on this area down in here, just right by the insula. Okay, and there's two sides to it. They're kind of almond shaped in, in that way. But what they are is they are there for threat of, or detection of threat is what they do. And they are fully developed at birth and they pretty much come online around the seventh month they start of gestation in that respect. Uh, but they can, they project to other areas of our brain uh, and they'll respond in about a twelfth of a second to threat. So that's pretty quick, a twelfth of a second. Uh, a good example is, let's say <clears throat> you're, you're walking along a trail. When, when out of the corner of your eye, you detect, not see, but detect, in your periphery, this long, round, sort of crooked form lying in the grass, okay? Immediately, without thinking, and within less than one second, you respond by jumping back and immediately to mind snake. But within two to three seconds, your eyes and your mind, they can focus and realize, oh, it's just a stick. This is a great example of, of our amygdala immediately responding to other areas of the brain for a reaction. They turn those other areas of the brain on, the motor cortex, by jumping back, okay? So when we're born, our amygdala is, is developed. It's ready to start learning about threat both from internal and external cues uh, based on temperament and learned actions or inactions of our caregivers in that respect. This wiring up lasts a lifetime and it's called plasticity, this continuous wiring, and it can be changed somewhat by training or later conditioning. It's been said that the amygdala never forgets meaning there will be an implicit response to previous instantiated threats. So many, to explain this, many of you have heard the, the three reactions to threat. There's, there's fight, there's flight, and there's freeze, okay? This is an unconscious automatic response coming from our sympathetic nervous system, uh, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, pituitary, and what we call the adrenal axes. Uh, interesting, interestingly, in adult attachment, the three insecure attachments, anxious, preoccupied, dismissive, avoidant, and fearful avoidant, are related to these automatic responses. Anxious, preoccupied is a fight response, this, this combative reaction, okay? You'll find that a lot in anxious, preoccupied. Uh, dismissive avoidant, uh, as you guessed, is, is this flight response. They, they run away, they, they avoid, okay, a uh, flight response. And fearful avoidant can be uh, either a freeze, it's namely a freeze, and then there's could be a flight response. So you can see that's, that's how they, they connect between attachment and these, these emotional responses to very, very... Uh, emotional stimuli, okay? <clears throat> All right. So, along with normal development, the developmental occurrence is, is that in the first two to three years, 
the child's right hemisphere is in hyperdrive, this, this side right here, okay? Making synaptic connections, synaptic connections, and formulating an, an emotional foundation for the remainder of their lives. <clears throat> the deeper recesses of our brain, called the limbic area also, what I showed you earlier, down in here, is, is also wiring, it's wiring up with our right side. Remember this, this white here, this corpus callosum? Uh, it's, it's wiring up to our right side, uh, allowing for emotional interpretations for life and, uh, and life's vicissitudes, as we say. <clears throat> now, researchers have proved our right hemisphere is more inclined to store and react to emotional stimuli as opposed to the left hemisphere's analytical process on this side of our brain. Uh, about the, around the age of three, about three years of age, we see language becoming very salient and prominent in, in children. It coming online with the analytical thought processes that's being developed at a time and used. Uh, this is what we call synaptogenesis, or wiring up of the left hemisphere area, much like the right is wiring up in the first two years in those emotional memories and, and, and stimuli that's going on. <clears throat> Typically our first memories are around the third year of life. <clears throat> this is due to language uh, providing what we call episodic memories. If you have if if I'm, I've had clients who can only recall back to the age of six or seven, and to me this indicates some form of trauma in their childhood, because trauma inhibits the encoding of long-term episodic or autobiographical memories. Now memories prior to organized language, which is around the age of three, are memories that are non-recollected, that cannot be recalled during language periods that cannot be recalled even though they have language, are, are still stored in our limbic and associated cortical areas, which includes uh, the amygdala and, and the right temporal lobe, okay, which is basically here through this area around our ears, okay? <clears throat> These are what we call unconscious memories, implicit reactions. When we react in negative ways or, or avoid things, but can't explain why, this is an example of implicit memory, which is, it's not in conscious awareness, however, but it will dictate our actions and behavior. Uh, a good example is uh, of unconscious memory was an experiment back at the, in the 50s or late 40s with a nine month old baby called Little Albert. And if you've studied any kind of psychology, it's where the story's well known, but. Little Albert was exposed to a big white guinea pig and, and he played with it for several days showing no signs of, of fear or discomfort. Uh, eventually the, the researchers started making these, these sharp sounds, um, a metal to metal banging, and we know how kids react to these startling sounds. Uh, and it startled Little Albert and it made him cry while he was playing with the white guinea pig. So. After the first day of, of doing this, the second day, when presented with the white guinea pig and there was no sound, that sharp metal to metal banging wasn't there, little Albert would become hysterical, you know. Uh, so this experiment was known as Pavlonian conditioning or classical conditioning. And today it's considered highly unethical to use human subjects in this way. Uh, because little Albert went from, from calmness with the playful white guinea pig to, to crying and, and being highly uncomfortable without any noise being associated. So as Albert grew into a young man throughout his development and even into adulthood, he was mortified of anything that was white and furry, like fur coats, uh, white animals, fur hats, like sheep. Uh, but he couldn't say why, okay? He would have these panic-like symptoms. Luckily, some other researchers discovered this and helped him to overcome this phobia. This is what we call extinction, and it's a behavioral treatment used today for some cases. So we can see how implicit memory
plays into that. You know, little Albert didn't know why he was scared and having these panic-like phobic reactions to things that were white because they were stored in his implicit memory prior to the age of three. <clears throat> I want to ex somewhat explain emotions and <clears throat> because this is what develops from attachment between caregiver and child, especially in the first two to three years when our brains are permanently wiring up or, or becoming emotionally sensitive to the environment. Caregivers and, and, and their attachment approaches have about a 50% influence on how that child emotionally reacts to events uh, through, throughout their life. The other 50% is a, is a genetic influence, uh, what we call temperament. <clears throat> so we can all think of those who are highly reactive to emotional stimuli, I'm sure, and they have trouble settling down are those who seem somewhat numb and disengaged from their emotional selves. This is a combination of their temperament and how they attach to their parents, what we call epigenetics, that fancy word of bringing environment in with those genetic temperaments, okay? And how they can change and influence each other. Now we're going to review the, the four types. We're going to tie attachment in here. The, the four types of childhood attachment models and the trans and then transfer over to adult attachment types and then tie in emotional reactivity, which predominantly lasts for a lifetime, okay? <clears throat> the first child adult attachment is what we call, if you remember, what we call secure. And it's witnessed in about... 50 to 60 percent of American population. Um, I want to emphasize that all these attachment types are done at the unconscious level, below awareness. Uh, secure attachment means that the individual unconsciously knows that their partner is typically available and supportive in times of need and has a, a sense of felt security, uh, which helps reduce distress and calms, which in turn will produce positive emotions. Even though they get charged up, a calmness and a sense of comfort develops in a, in, in a short duration. Uh, and it's a return to what we call homeostasis or this ecological balance because they depend upon their mates availability and support. It's there, okay? <clears throat> now, the other three subgroupings of what we call insecure attachment make up about 40 to 50 percent of the remaining population. They are, they are anxious, preoccupied, dismissive, avoidant, and fearful avoidant. We've talked about those before, but I'm going to tie emotions into those, okay? Anxious, preoccupied is this ambivalent state. It occurs during development when the parent is inconsistent in care. Uh, the child cannot realistically predict the actions of the caregiver. One moment uh, they are not available, or the next the parent is being intruding on the child's world and disturbing their sense of independence. <clears throat> the parent doesn't, doesn't react in a consistent manner to the child's need or, or they tend to smother the child and their behavior by being overly intrusive. Uh, as we've, some call this helicopter parenting, <clears throat> we've talked about before. It's just constantly hovering over the child and not allowing this exploration and discovery when the child is in their seeking mode. In adulthood, this appears as an overly preoccupied attentiveness to the partner at times, followed by inattentiveness, inattentiveness, and emotional space. Uh, that is why it's referred to as ambiguous because it's sort of like, I love you one moment, followed by get away from me, I can't stand you the next. So the adult who is ambivalent, preoccupied, uh, displays an anxious overdependence and extreme clinging to others for, for fear of abandonment. They tend to 
present as powerless and weak and view their partners as powerful and controlling. Uh, at times they display superficial attempts of dominance and feigned independence, um, which causes discomfort because in essence, deep down, they are indecisive for fear of criticism. Uh, they are predominantly right brain, as we talked about on this side, here right, right brain, and in their thinking, which is emotional, uh, and the emotions, the six that we listed, uh, are displayed fairly easily with little provocation, so they're very sensitive in that. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to get them going. Uh, they're very reactive and, and sensitive to that, to what's going on in their environment and to their mate. <clears throat> the next is, is of insecure is what we call dismissive avoidance. In childhood, the parent is, is basically not meeting the, the wants and the needs of the child and is not helping to soothe or downregulate the emotions. What occurs, a child learns to stop crying and, and seeking attention. Uh, even though they exhibit no outward signs of distress, uh, research has shown that there's a revved up nervous system uh, with pulse and blood pressure being elevated uh, uh, higher than normal cortisol levels. If the parent leaves the room, you know, they, they won't seek or react to them leaving, but they'll just continue uh, doing what they're doing in, in that respect and what they're engaged in. Uh, once the parent returns, they, they ignore or, or dismiss the parent's presence. In adulthood, uh, behaviors displayed are characterized by extreme self-reliance and distrust of others. <clears throat> They're detached and see significant others as, as unreliable, uh, defective, and potentially hurtful. Uh, so they create an imaginary wall to, pro to protect themselves uh, and may utilize fantasy. But with all of this, they're, they utilize these narcissistic traits, often berate, ber berating or blaming or castigating or condescending their partner. Uh, sometimes rageful anger is displayed. Now, the rageful anger, this is due to not regularly expressing their feelings and an explosive behavior follows because, you know, they're avoiding, they don't want to talk about their feelings. So it builds up and this rageful anger happens. This explosive uh, emotive sense occurs. Uh, they basically won't allow their mate to share in their emotional turmoil and they're reticent, silent when it comes to talking about what's bothering them. We do not witness a lot of surprise or outward displays of this euphoric happiness. Mainly it's just this even keel, but anger is very emotive and, and, it, and it can be, and they can be personally attacking when it comes time, okay? All right, the last one is what we have labeled uh, is the most psychopathological when it comes to relationships, and that's the fearful avoidant. What this means is the recipient of their love and adoration is also a source of, of fear and threat, okay? Children who are severely punished or, or verbally castigated in shame uh, become disorganized and, and disoriented during development. It's what we call this unresolved state of identity. <clears throat> in a sense, they are confused as to attachment figures and who they can trust. Now, there's a deep longing for significant others, but on the other hand, they are fearful and, and they're afraid of rejection or punishment. Uh, at times they, they seem unable to make decisions, remember indecisive. Uh, they're disorganized and confused as to where they stand with their mate. A dis, it's sort of a disoriented condition of unresolved issues. Excuse me. <clears throat> Typically, um, they maintain separation and, and emotional distance uh, and approach when summoned, okay? 
until they're summoned or when they feel like something is favorable, uh, at which time they may become overly enthusiastic and, and overwhelming uh, because they've been included. <clears throat> they don't know how to maintain emotional balance. What we witness are displays of, of all emotions that are beyond normative along perhaps with impulsivity or some other forms of impulsive behavior. Sometimes they just leave us scratching our heads trying to figure out you know, their actions. So the four attachment types, so we're going to kind of sum up here, <coughs> are secure, anxious, preoccupied, which is an ambivalent state, we say, uh, dismissive avoidant, and fearful avoidant, which has this disorganized, disoriented sort of sense to it. These attachment categories are directly related to one's ability to emotionally regulate uh, because it's what they have learned and been conditioned throughout early development, the wiring up of their brain. It's, it's a lifelong, it's lifelong, basically permanent and can only change by degree, for better or for worse, uh, depending on the other mate's attachment style. <coughs> Our caregivers, they teach us if, if us if the world is, is safe or unsafe and if people could be trusted to rely on and, and be there in times of crisis or, uh, or traumatic event. Secure attachment allows for a trusting bond of consistent safety and teaches us this, this calming effects in tumultuous times. On the other side is insecure attachment, and that's about half of us, where we have learned the world is not safe. Others cannot be trusted to be a safe haven or a secure base, as we said earlier, or will not be consistently there for us as that safe base in, in, in that respect. Now, uh, I want to emphasize here that these four types are not completely independent categories when it comes to the human condition. There is this overlap, this, this blending of types. This is what makes us so unique and human. This complicated psychological mixture of, of emotional attachment categories, okay? What's really unique here is, and I need to add this, it just came to mind, is that when pairing up when bonding in relationships. Avoidance, seek and enter into relationships with anxious preoccupied uh, and, and vice versa, okay? That's kind of unique in that sense. Secure types typically will seek mates who themselves are securely attached. But of course, this is not always the case. A securely Attached mate can teach and model for insecure individuals, helping them change over time. Also, counseling is a great venue to explore and change those things that are negative in a relationship. So if you feel like you're having trouble in a relationship, reach out to a licensed counselor. Now, if we try to unload on a friend, we find typically they have just as many problems as we do and they want to talk about their problems and their difficulties. So reach out to me. Feel free to private message me or, or email me at agapicounselor at outlook.com or you can text me at 256-599-0291. I will do what I can to direct you or help you in any way. I hope this vlog has shed some light on emotions and adult attachment types. Maybe you've seen some of these characteristics in yourself or maybe your partner. Remember, you, you, you can't change them, okay? You can only change yourself. Maranatha.